Inquisitor Fonseca, Enlightenment Strike Team leader, centers himself as the free-falling skyship hurtles down towards the Opera House roof. With their characteristically ruthless efficiency, agents of the Inquisition have identified this place as the bolt hole of the criminal organization known as the Web, and no lesser a luminary of the Order than Abbot Cadilius, right-hand man to the Lord Inquisitor himself, has tasked von Seeker with leading the Seek and Destroy mission. Despite reciting the sacred mantras, von Seeker feels the savage thrill of anticipation. There will be no escape for these scum, these transgressors against the holy seekers, now that the righteous light of Droom is cast upon them. And any that survive this assault will suffer one thousand deaths at the hands of the Enlightenment's purifiers. He has to force the smile from his face at the thought. He turns his attention to his team, clad in the pale blue and pristine white of the Order. They are masked, and their robes are tightly wrapped at ankle and wrist the elite of the Seeker's ranks. Gather your faith about you, my Inquisitors, and brace for impact. Glory be to Droom! Their skyship has hit terminal velocity by the time it strikes the Opera House. By rights, the impact should smash both it and its occupants to pieces, but the magics of the Seekers of Droom are potent indeed. The roof explodes inwards in a shower of glass, timber and plaster, leaving the skyship unharmed and hovering stationary above the scene of chaos below. Go, go, go! Fonseca bellows, and the strike team are out and moving, propelling down their drop lines in perfect unison towards their panicking quarry. They are holy, they are righteous, they are unstoppable. It's at that point that a tiny sliver of doubt enters Fonseca's mind. Because it's at that point that a vampire comes leaping out of the roiling dust, sinks its fangs into a shrieking inquisitor, and with a nonchalant flick of its head, tears his throat wide open. Hello and welcome to The Lone Adventurer, an actual play solo RPG podcast with me, Carl White. I will be your narrator, your game master, and your guide as we follow our heroes on their journey into the unknown. For this game, I'll be using the Blades in the Dark rule set, as well as a variety of other systems, tools, and tables as they take my fancy. A word of warning. The following scenes may contain mature themes and disturbing imagery. Listener discretion is advised. The adventure continues. Last time on The Lone Adventurer, the chickens truly came home to roost. The crew had been reunited and were celebrating a rare win, having taken out two key unseen supply depots. Mina Montessario had joined them, and there was the suggestion of a possible alliance in the air. But the good times couldn't last. In short order, their secret opera house HQ was invaded, first by Lord Tortimus and his vampire spawn, then by the vengeful Unseen, then by a thoroughly pissed off army of bluecoats, and finally by a deadly Enlightenment strike team. With the world literally falling down around their ears, and with seemingly no way out, it looks like our heroes are facing the final curtain. Alright, strap in, this is the big one. We have ourselves a five-way, no-holds-barred throwdown, and everyone is gunning for everyone, but for our heroes most of all. Now, Blades in the Dark is primarily intended as a vehicle for intrigue and heist stories. Creeping about, making daring escapes, that sort of thing. It's not really built for the utter carnage and chaos of what we're facing here. And so for this battle, I've decided to make some fairly extensive changes to my normal rule set. Both to make up for the fact that we don't have an actual GM coming up with weird and wonderful colour and creativity that we might normally expect in a mass battle, and also 
because I feel like stress-testing a fairly weird combination of game tools. Let me explain. I'm going to be making action rolls for my crew as normal, marking off ticks on clocks for each of my enemy groups as the web's actions succeed in overcoming them. And, of course, they'll be suffering the consequences of any partial successes or failures, with me referring to my consequence oracle to see what happens. So far, so normal. But for such a climactic and complicated battle, I want things to be a little bit more chaotic than that. More unpredictable. And with more scope for each of the multiple enemy groups to function independently and unexpectedly than we would normally have in a Blades game. And to achieve that, I'm going to adopt the kitchen sink approach. Chuck everything in. I mentioned a while back that I was missing Mythic and its ability to tie stories to character or thread lists. Well, for this battle, Mythic is back, though in a fairly non-traditional manner. After the result of each action roll that my characters make, I'm going to move the chaos factor up or down one based on the current game state. And then I'm going to ask a simple question of my Mythic deck. Again, that question will be based on where we are currently in the story. Whatever seems the most obvious, unanswered question at the time, that's what I'll ask. And in case I get a random event, I've created a custom character list and thread list to refer to, with a much narrower scope than is normal for Mythic. Instead of seeding the tool with campaign-wide threads and characters, I'll only be including threads and characters pertinent to this battle. This is Mythic, zoomed in. But that's not all. Way, way back in the very first episode of The Lone Adventurer, I used an NPC tactics tool, devised by a user spitting image from the RPG Net forum, to determine how the citizens of the spot would react to a gang of machine cultists chasing after Mina Montessario. Well, to help me work out how each of my many NPC factions are going to act in this battle, I've dusted that tool off once more and I'll be consulting it after each mythic step that I resolve. I've assigned each enemy group an aggression rating, between 1 and 6, and these can rise or fall during the battle, depending on the mindset and the status of that group. To find an opponent's tactic for the round, I'll roll 2d6 of the same colour and 1d6 of a different colour. If the single die comes up a 1, 2 or 3, that group will continue the same tactic from their previous round. On a 4 or 5, I'll total the two same coloured dice and add the aggression score for that group, then select the matching result from 16 different options on my tactics table. Everything from panic at one end of the range to frenzy at the other. If the single die shows a 6, I'll roll it again for a result from a twist table. All the specifics, including the tables, are in the show notes if you want to take a look behind the scenes or if you want to use the tool for your own games. OK, that's the setup. The spring is coiled, the machine is primed. Let's see where this unholy, untested procedural Frankenstein's monster takes us. Like I said, strap in. This could be a bumpy ride. With the world around them going to hell in a handcart, Crater is the only one of them that stands his ground. Perhaps it's down to him having necked the best part of a bottle of Kyrel Red. Perhaps it's the result of those two pinches of dream dust he's put up his nose. Whatever the reason, when the roof explodes inwards and the air suddenly is full of falling debris, abseiling ninja fanatics and leaping vampires, Crater doesn't run in panic. Instead, he spits and aims his pistol. Ignoring the crossbow bolts whistling past him and the chunks of plaster and masonry thudding down around him, he closes one eye, breathes slowly out, and squeezes the trigger. The central pillar supporting the circle bursts into splinters. Already weakened by the demolished roof, the whole of the lower circle shifts alarmingly and then, with an almighty rending sound, collapses in on itself. The unseen snipers, along with their leader, vanish in a huge cloud of dust. Pick your targets now, you flesh thieving fuckers, Crater grins, but his elation doesn't last long. There's something wrong with Tatters. Tatters, are you okay? He calls out, seeing the girl on all fours across the stage. She seems to be 
twitching, her back arching. He weaves through falling debris towards her, but as he does so, her head snaps around and he freezes in place, horrified. Her eyes, which have looked wrong ever since the prison break, are now twin vortices into hell. Her lips have peeled back from her teeth into a grin that would look better on a corpse, and there seem to be spectral horns protruding from her forehead. Stay back, she snarls, and there is far too little of tatters in that voice for Crater's comfort. Stay back! I can't control it! There is no sign of the unseen, and the vampires seem to have vanished into the shadows once more. But from her vantage point in the wings where she has taken cover, the spider spots blue coats at both the side exits. The net is closing in on them, but there is a much more pressing concern. The Enlightenment, swiftly descending their drop lines, are almost upon them. Trace, she calls out, pointing. Take out the leader! Trace emerges from behind an overturned sofa, bow in hand, and lets fly with a single graceful motion. The arrow hurtles towards the Inquisitor's unarmoured throat, a perfect shot, but at the last possible instant, Fonseca's hand lashes out. The arrow punches through his forearm and stops, the point a fraction of an inch before its intended target. The Inquisitor drops from his line, arrow through his arm, but flips as he falls, landing on the stage with all the impact and twice the grace of a falling feather. In rapid succession, his team land and form up behind him. Shit, mutters Trace, backing away. Who the fuck are these guys? The voice of the bluecoat rings out again, echoing around the auditorium. This is Sergeant Dablonsky of the Blows. All occupants of this building, you are under arrest. Drop your weapons, lie face down and put your hands on your heads. This is your final warning. Up on the stage, Fonseca scowls, tearing the arrow free of his arm with a grimace of pain. You can ignore the bleatings of the lambs, my quarry. We are your predators and your end. Fight us if you wish, or flee from us, or beg for mercy. It matters not. The Enlightenment has come for you, and there is no escape. The spider, desperate to buy her team some breathing room, tries to stall for time. She spreads her hands, palms out. Inquisitor, we are not your enemies. What happened to your team at the Doctor's premises was a tragedy, but not one of our making. The Doomsinger, Heart of Snow, played us all for his own ends. It's him you should be seeking. Fonseca clearly likes the sound of his own voice. Despite the bedlam all around, he seems to feel the need to toy with his prey. Though you needn't worry about him. The Doomsinger has marked himself an enemy of Droom, and thus marked, there is nowhere he can hide from the Enlightenment. As you yourselves have discovered. Surrender yourselves, and... Whatever generous offer the Inquisitor was about to make is cut off, as several things happen at once. There is an ominous groan that reverberates through the entire building, as the unsupported upper circle decides whether or not it is going to collapse. From the side exit comes the call... Smoke them out! And a couple of fizzing steel balls are hurled by the Blues into the auditorium. And at the back of the group of Seekers, one of their number inexplicably cold cocks the Inquisitor in front. But none of those events are what draw every eye. That honour is reserved for something else entirely. On the far side of the stage, Crater has failed to heed Tatter's warning. He reaches out to help her and finds himself seized and lifted from his feet by his neck, the young girl's grip like a vice. His eyes bulge, he claws desperately at the hand, but to no avail. Tatter's body is growing larger, obscene purple muscle bulging and writhing beneath the skin, her whole form twisting to something gruesome and vile. She grins, and her teeth are shark-like, her gaze utterly terrifying. When she speaks, a trace of tatters is gone. Finally, the demon Satara purrs, observing Traitor's futile struggles with amusement. It's time to have some fun. Well, I asked for chaos, and my hodgepodge of tools have delivered in spades. With so many moving parts, I'm not going to dive into the minutiae of how that scene unfolded. 
All the details of what happened are in the show notes if you're interested. What I'll do instead is just provide the edited highlights to give a feel for how the tools are working and how the story has emerged from the results. We kicked off with a success with consequence wreck roll for Crater, which advanced the unseen clock and caused Crater some stress. I decided the chaos factor should go up and then asked if the unseen were temporarily out of the action. Yes, said Mythic, but there's a problem with tatters. The problem, said I, what manner of problem might this be? Well, said Mythic, you're not going to like this. Then I went round my factions to see what they were up to. The Undying had scarpered, the Bluecoats were probing, the Seekers were charging, and Mino was performing a feint. Then it was time for action two. Trace got a success sniping at the Seeker boss using Hunt, I updated my clocks, and it turned out that the leader had fallen from his rope. A new set of faction tactics rolled, and this time I got Bargain for the Bluecoats and Taunt for the Seekers. Time for some talking. That gave Spider an opportunity to step in for the next action roll. I decided to use Sway to buy some time and keep Fonseca talking, and I got a success with a consequence. The consequence was to mark a clock, and as I didn't have any danger clocks running, I decided the logical one to add was that the building was on the verge of collapse. If that clock fills up, the battlefield changes significantly, and a lot of folks are going to get hurt. But because this roll was against a desperate position, I decided that wasn't enough. I made a second consequence roll, and this time I got a new obstacle or threat appears. What manner of obstacle? I asked, and the response was agree power. That took me back to the deal Tatus had made with her demon, with the conclusion being that Satara had chosen this moment to call in his debt. Then it was time for the mythic question, which was, does Satara attack a foe? The answer, unfortunately, was no, and a random roll showed that Crater was going to be the one in the firing line, which made sense. And finally, my faction rolls revealed that the Blues were changing their approach to a new weapon, and Satara was adopting a balanced approach. That's it for the mechanics. I think they seem to be working well enough so far, if by well enough I mean they are injecting vast amounts of uncertainty and danger into the proceedings. Time will tell if I've injected too much of either. Right, let's get back to it, after this short interlude. Hi, I'm Steve Morrison, and I've combined my love of writing fiction and tabletop gaming into a solo actual play series called Errant Adventures. Join me as I explore different stories in different genres using a variety of my favorite tabletop role-playing games. If you enjoy space adventure, check out Season 1, Tarquin, which follows the adventures of a young herald running from family drama. Or check out the new Season 3, Cry Havoc, and follow mender Alexis Wolf as she tries to help the people of Skoroko Station. If fantasy's more your jam, check out Season 2, Talon and Crest, where members of the Crest Mercenary Company try to make their way in the city of Heartvale. I've also got shorter runs of stories covering a range of genres and games. Whether a long-form campaign or a short series, Errant Adventures features stories told at the speed of dice. So join me on the podcatcher of your choice as I discover where the story goes next. Sallow emerges from beneath the overturned armchair where he'd been cowering, and gapes at the thing that had once been tatters, holding Crater aloft. Not human. Not remotely human. Sallow's grip on reality is tenuous at the best of times, but this is beyond anything he has had to deal with before. The impression the creature leaves on his psyche, like a livid psychic bruise, takes him to the brink of mental collapse. But Trace was right. These are the only true friends he has ever known. No matter what he has done to them by allowing Tortimus in, they are all that anchor him to himself. And he will not see them harmed, not if he can help it. One of the advantages of seeing the world from a different angle to most people is that you tend to spot the things that others overlook. He sprints from his hiding place, ducking past one of the Inquisitors and the Spider, and then into the wings. There, he seizes one of a series of levers and pulls down as hard as he can. A trapdoor opens, 
but not Billy Satara as Sallow had hoped. Instead, it's another trapdoor entirely, this one positioned directly beneath Trace, who is just in the process of lining up a shot on the demon. She drops with a cry, then the trapdoor snaps closed behind her again. Shit! Sallow cries, tucking at his hair with both hands. Wrong lever! That's the moment the bluecoats gas bombs land. Thick, choking green smoke begins to pour out from them, spreading rapidly. But before the combatants can be incapacitated, vampires begin to drop from the shattered remnants of the roof. They land and hurl the bombs back towards the blues, seemingly unaffected by the gas. Sergeant Jablonski's panicked curses, magically amplified, echo around the opera house. Valerian, meanwhile, has troubles of his own. Several unseen thugs have finally emerged from beneath the rubble, and their fall doesn't appear to have improved their mood any. There's one! Wade growls, pointing at Valerian as he stumbles, retching out of the cloud of gas. Shoot the bastard! Even half incapacitated, Valerian senses the obvious opportunity. He forces himself into a sprint across the front of the stage, crossbow bolts whistling past him. He's yelling as he goes. You halfwits couldn't hit the broadside of a barn! He comes to a hard stop, yells, Sallow, leave a four! And then vanishes from sight into the trapdoor that opens beneath his feet. The bolts that have been hurtling towards him slam instead into the backs of several of the Enlightenment strike force. The only two left alive seem to be wrestling desperately with one another, rolling across the stage floor behind a suddenly exposed von Seeker. Jablonski's voice rings out once more. Booker this! Higher priority target! Incursion protocols in effect! All units move in and take out that bloody demon! Send in the leveller! There is an almighty crash as the far wall bursts in, and an enormous armoured vehicle, painted blue with exhaust vents spewing arcane smoke, rolls into the amphitheatre. Seats, upholstered in tattered red velvet, shatter beneath its huge treads. Twin tubes, attached to each side of the behemoth, spew fire, peppering the demon with explosions that seem to have no effect. Sitara turns with a snarl, flinging Crater aside like a limp rag doll and leaps, covering perhaps 60 feet in a single bound. The demon lands atop the tank with an impact like thunder and begins to rake its claws through armoured steel plates like it's slicing cheese. The spider has seen enough. We can't survive much more of this. Sallow, I'm going for Crater. Open me a trap door, then follow. Understand? Fonseca steps into her path, righteous fury blazing in his eyes. You're going nowhere, woman, he snarls. You shall face the purifying light of Droom. He is cut off as Crater barrels into the back of him, slamming him into the stage. You talk too much, the big man growls between brutal punches to Fonseca's head. Blow after blow thuds into the Inquisitor until he is nothing but a twitching, bloody mess. The spider reaches out a hand. Enough, Crater. He's done. Time to go. The big man looks up at the spider, concern creasing his blood-spattered face. But but what about tatters? We can't leave her like that. He gestures helplessly at the unholy monstrosity, tearing its way effortlessly through an entire armoured squad of bluecoats. The spider is forced to duck as crossbow bolts start to fly towards them. The unseen are closing in. There's nothing more we can do for her, Crater. We're out of time, and we're out of options. It's run or die. Move! Well, Sallow's luck doesn't get any better. That was a straight failure on his tinker roll to open the trapdoor beneath the demon, and after all that build-up, too. As a consequence, he took two stress and lost something important, namely Trace. With the faction tactics role showing me the Unseen were back in the fight, it was time for Valerian to taunt them into shooting at another enemy. Normally, as GM, I'd consider it a stretch to have a PC use a sway action for this attempt, perhaps suggesting the use of finesse instead. But Valerian has a special ability, the Brook's Gambit, which allows him to substitute sway for another action, with a little bit of in-game justification. Using that, with an assist from Sallow, he got four dice to roll, but only managed a success with a consequence. Now, this whole situation has obviously been incredibly perilous from the get-go. 
and so every action role I've made so far has been against a desperate position. The way I've been interpreting desperate consequences is to roll twice on the consequence table, and this time I got mark clock segments and a new threat. For the threat, I asked the oracle and got support tool. And for the clock, I marked off another two ticks on my building collapsing clock. Only two ticks left. Well, combining those two things gave me the idea of a Magitek tank crashing through the wall. As far as the success went, wherever NPC on NPC violence has been taking place, I've just been inflicting a single clock tick instead of the standard two, representing the greater agency my PCs have in the story. But it all adds up over time, and my Seeker team were now down to only one clock segment. Adding in a straight success from Crater, aided and abetted by the Spider's distraction, and a push, and the Seekers were down. With the exception of what's happened to Port Tatters, things do seem to be going surprisingly well, with the bad guys all fighting each other, and the party seemingly on the verge of escape. There's just one problem. They're not. Along with all those bad guy clocks, I created an escape clock at the start of this scene. I ruled that until at least two enemy factions were down, the party couldn't make action rolls to advance this clock, but that for each faction that was taken out, they could mark two ticks on the clock. That means that the escape clock currently stands at just two out of eight, and until at least one more faction falls, that's where it's going to be staying. As promising as things look right now, I'm afraid things are likely to get worse before they get better. We'll find out what new trials await our plucky band next time. You have been listening to The Lone Adventurer, the solo RPG podcast played, written, and performed by me, Carl White. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider telling your friends about it or leaving a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. It really is a huge help. You can find me on Twitter at TheLoneADV. You can email me at TheLoneADV at gmail.com or follow my blog at carlillustration.wordpress.com. You can find show notes for this episode and all the others at theloneadventurer.podbean.com, where I include any links mentioned in the episode as well as mechanics information. I also include a link to a full episode transcript. The story will continue in the next episode of The Lone Adventurer. Thank you for listening. There is only darkness. Everything is utterly still, utterly silent. There is no sense of self, no sense of otherness, only eternal darkness. And yet, awareness slowly grows, a sense of some foul, malignant presence that permeates the endless absence of this place. A dread sense of threat that by its very existence sparks a hint of self. A sense of who she is. She scrambles frantically for a fingerhold on consciousness and latches onto a dimly recalled fragment of reality that serves as an anchor. Her name is Tatiana. Tatiana Kamedev. She is an arcanist, a member of the web. And that loathsome presence, lurking in the depths, is an usurper, a thief, an invader. She is profoundly disoriented, lost in her mind, hopelessly separated from herself. But at some deep, primordial level, she understands that an unholy violation has occurred. That she has been cast from her own body, and that something else has taken control. Satara. And with that realisation, the full fury of her will is unleashed upon the demon. Her mind rages at her confinement, tears at the bonds that hold her buried deep below the surface. Her dark power cannot be denied. 
It is a howling, burning thing that shreds the demon's hold over her and erupts outwards in a devastating wave. You want to take over? The demon's voice whispers in her mind. Ah well, it was fun while it lasted. Until next time. The demon form falls away and then Tatters is back in the world. Any relief she might feel lasts only as long as it takes for her to take in her surroundings. She is standing on the lacerated ruins of a tank in a collapsing opera house, surrounded by the torn and brutalised bodies of a score of bluecoats, with twice that number moving in for the kill. They do not look to be in the mood for polite conversation, more in the mood for vicious, bloody retribution. And her crew are nowhere to be seen.